Hello and welcome to a new spontaneous video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. It is like sometimes really the spirit leads me to do something like this. I didn't plan on doing this video on the night of the 28th of March 2017, but anyway, a few hours ago I was on the way to a client to sell some wine and I had some spare minutes before I had to arrive there. And um, I'm reading a little bit in the book um, Code Word Babylon from P.D. Stewart. Um, I will explain that in the video to come. And um, because I was reading with Brett Norman uh, short weeks, uh, a week or two ago in The Secret History of the Jesuits from Edmond Paris, a chapter about the moral of the Jesuits, P.D. Stewart in his book deals with the same subject. And I thought, I'm going to make a short little video just to tell the people a little about, a glimpse about what the Jesuits and what the morals of the Jesuits, if you can even call it morals, of the Jesuits really are. But without any further ado, I'm going to send you to my little video that I took with my cell phone when I was sitting in my car reading in the book, 10 minutes or something about that before I had to go to my client. Just a little teaser of to tell you about what the Jesuits consider at their morals. Don't come complaining to me that you didn't know that the society of Jesus actually is the society of Satan. Now, enjoy my little pre-recorded video from the car right here. So, hello, this is Juggler66 from Hour of the Truth, as I announced it. I have a few minutes before I have to go to a client and sell some wine to read a little bit in the book Code Word Babylon by P.D. Stewart, Danger in the Vatican, meaning that is part one. Well, I don't want to repeat the introduction that I will make later to this, so I'm going to start reading on page 59, The Art of Evil, the Moral Theology of the Jesuits. It starts with a quote from King James I, King of England, the one who gave us, among, <laughs> of course, the committee that he put in power, the King James Bible. Quote, Impostors under a veil of piety, wolves in sheep's clothing, troublers of the public peace, men of diabolical industry, serpents, and very cockademons, very cockademons of whom all should be aware and fly from them, unquote, of the king. Now we have behind, for a moment, the bloody tracks of the Jesuits, and come now to consider their moral theology, the rules of engagement of the quote-unquote society of Jesus. One ex-pupil of the Jesuits, who had studied under them for eight years, said of his former masters, quote, the objective of the disciples of Loyola, is to acquire the highest offices of state for the men they have poisoned with their maxims." Unquote. Now, what are these maxims? If any man desires to understand what kind of being a Jesuit really is, let him read their moral theology. The moral theology of the Jesuits can be summed up in three great rules by which they direct all their affairs and great enterprises. First, that the end justifies the means, in other words, by any means necessary. Second, that it is safe to do any action if it be probably right, although it may be more probably wrong. And three, that if one knows how to direct the intention right, i.e. by using good intentions, there is no deed whatever its moral character which one may not do. This letter motto gives the Jesuits license of acting so immense that at that to at there too were an altogether superfluous and indeed an impossible task. Yeah. <laughs> I butchered that sentence a little bit, so let me repeat this. This letter motto meaning that if one knows how to direct the intention aright, i.e. by using good intentions, there is no deed whatever is moral character which one may not do. This letter motto gives the Jesuits license of acting so immense that to add thereto were an altogether superfluous and indeed an even impossible task.
In short, it is an omnibus clause, <laughs> meaning covering absolutely all eventualities, containing the whole sum of the Jesuit theory, the theory of everything better known as casuistry and probabilism. The three rules, these three rules, particularly the last, we find in all their great books, and they make the Jesuits extremely dexterous logis logician, for they are able to rationalize any position by using loose logic, creating their own morality as the circumstances demand, when it is deemed necessary or advantageous to the Jesuits or their order. Now, I made a little remark here on the site, and you will see directly why, because this is a very important part of the reading. All of their rules, all of their great doctrines can be summed up in this one phrase. Quote, it is lawful if the end is lawful or if the intention is good. Unquote. By all means necessary, right? This is exactly what this means. It is lawful if the end is lawful, but who makes the laws? They make up the laws themselves. The Roman Catholic Church makes up the laws. Satan makes up the laws. So it is lawful if the end is lawful. So of course the end is always lawful when I make the rules. Or if the intention is good, what is good? Well, good is bad and bad is good. White is black and black is white. This is how we have to understand this. Wonderful, wonderful phrase. It really sums up their doctrines. It is lawful if the end is lawful, or if the intention is good. Now, this includes all that decent men can, uh, uh, can call crime. And, of course, the lawfulness of the end is always at the Jesuit's discretion. Thus, the Jesuit may always justify his actions, for it is their gospel that, quote, the end justifies the means, and that the intention is what matters, not the deed itself, unquote. With this two-edged sword, says James Edgar Wiley, the Jesuit cannot fail to cut his way wherever he has a mind to go, right <clears throat> wherever he has a, a mind to go, right on through all the codes of early jurisprudence, or even the statute, Book of Heaven, unquote. Hey, you still don't get it? You still don't get it? To enable the reader to form an independent judgment on this question, it is necessary to say a few words on the subject of casuistry that some good and noble end is to be served by disposing or killing of a rival. Say, for example, if he thinks he could make better use of his land or use the income from the rival's rich estate to give more alms to the poor, may the Jesuit dispose of his rival? Yes. Yes, of course, the end justifies the means. Here is an ingenious doctrine which enables a Jesuit to justify any crime he desires to commit. If I may use another hypothetical example to illustrate. Let us say a Jesuit reads that God commands us to love our neighbors. The Jesuit, in order to justify some end which he desires to achieve, could use the second of their rules probabilism to say, quote, if we are commanded to love our neighbors, then that probably means we can hate our enemies, unquote. What is my authority for these damning allegations? You want authority? Really? Here is the authority for you, in your face, and my, what an authority it is. It is Jesuit fathers Simon and Pintero. Here is what Father Simon says in his book, The Defense of Virtue, about the great commandment, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Quote, we are not so much commanded to love him, God, as not to hate him. And Jesuit Father Pintero assures us that, quote, deliverance from the grievous yoke of loving God is a privilege of the new covenant. Unquote. Thus, the Jesuits make void even the first and greatest commandment in the law of God. 
furnished with such rules that Jesuit can hold simultaneously two opinions, knowing them to be either completely contradictory or that they cancel each other out entirely. To understand more clearly their moral theology and what it really means in the Jesuit lexicography, suffer me to quote a few morsels from the most respected Jesuit authors, their best scholars and the ablest professors on the subject. To ensure correctness, I will now let these individuals speak for themselves whenever it is practicable and consistent with brevity. So, up to here. This little teaser from the book Code Word Babylon, Danger in the Vatican by P.D. Stewart. A wonderful book that I always have here in my car with me when I'm going driving to clients or wherever. And whenever I have time, read in it. When I go to the, cup, uh, when I go to the hairdresser or whenever, I got that book with me like now when I'm a little bit early to go to see my client. And by that, I thought I make a little teaser because this book, Code Word Babylon, is a book that I will surely read in the future. But for the moment, I have to tell you, I am reading a wonderful book which I get sent next uh, the next few days. I am reading the PDF right now, which is called History of the Inquisition by Patrick von Limborch. When you watch in my playlist Inquisition Update, uh, part 13 of Romanism and the Reformation, where Tom Fress reads from the wonderful book from Henry Gretton Guinness, he cites a little bit from the book History of the Inquisition from Limborch. And I wanted absolutely to read that. And I've done already 12 or 13 readings, and I will upload them all to my second YouTube channel. So at the end of this video, you will find uh, a little picture in picture, you know, these uh, suggestions in the end that I can make at the end of the video that lead to the playlist on my other YouTube channel that you can follow my book reading there, The History of the Inquisition. The book, The History of the Inquisition, is at least as important to understand as is code word Babylon. So, thank you very much for watching and listening, and I hope you will join me in my reading of History of the Inquisition, and yes, I will also read Code Word Babylon, but it's going to take quite some time. Until next time, Juggler66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. Says God bless you and bye bye.